The digital age is here and technology options are growing every day. We see endless possibilities in front of us to manage our personal matters and our chronic health conditions in order to make our lives better. This is Sally Schessler, Director of Education for Allergy and Asthma Network, and it's my pleasure to welcome you to Advances in Allergy and Asthma. This webinar series is presented in partnership with the American College of Allergy, Asthma, and Immunology. Today, we'll be looking at asthma monitoring options for the digital age, improving outcomes with Dr. Alan Meadows. This webinar helps the Allergy and Asthma Network live out our mission to end the needless death and suffering due to asthma, allergies, and related conditions through outreach, education, advocacy, and research. At this time, it's my pleasure to introduce today's speaker, Dr. Meadows. Dr. J. Allen Meadows is a board-certified allergist and immunologist who received his medical degree at the University of South Carolina and completed his residency in Mobile, Alabama. He finished his adult and pediatric fellowship in Denver, Colorado at National Jewish Center, a national referral center for respiratory problems. Dr. Meadows began his practice in 1991, choosing to locate in Montgomery, where his wife was raised. His mission is to educate his patients about the causes of coughing and allergic illness, and to teach his patients that they can lead a symptom-free life. He believes in treating and solving problems with a minimum of expense and trouble to the patient. He is currently part of Allergy Health. He believes that by taking a proactive stand on medical politics, he will better serve his patients' needs. He's very active in committees for the American College of Allergy, Asthma, and Immunology, and serves as the organization's past and media past president. Out of medicine, he's active in his church and enjoys time with his wife and family. And I know, Dr. Meadows, that you want to speak to your disclosures, but uh, we're just so grateful you're with us today. And thank you in advance for sharing your expertise. Uh, Sally, thanks. Thanks so much for the, the kind introduction and the Allergy and Asthma Network to uh, have me on tonight. I don't know. I was uh, actually, I, I almost hate to say this, but was just getting a little choked up about the the, the mission statement, uh, you know, to end these needless suffering. I um yeah, I saw some of that today, some need, needless suffering, and and hope that I was able to have a have a small part in in helping to end that uh, for this uh, for for this particular patient. But uh, thanks so so much. Yeah, uh, as Sally mentioned, I am a little bit of a socioeconomic expert, and I'm pleased to be giving a a, a scientific talk, actually with some socioeconomic uh, angles to it as as well. Uh, in terms of the disclosure, I like to list, you know, all the disclosures. There's one though that's particularly relevant uh, for this talk, and that's uh, the, the the Teva Pharmaceuticals. Uh, I, I am an advisor and and, and speaker uh, for them, and uh, they have products that that may be in the space or that are in the space uh, that we're talking about um, about tonight. Uh, so the learning objective: uh, technology has advanced, but uh, many providers, uh, patients, uh, really just many people are unaware of the potential visits uh, or the benefits of the new digital technologies. And doctors really need to be able to identify the role uh, of the new digital inhalers that are becoming uh, available um, fairly rapidly. Um, doctors and, and patients need to be able to know how to use digital inhalers. And really we, we, we need to use uh, shared decision makings uh, with patients uh, to choose digital technology. We'll talk a good, good bit about that, but that's one of the the most important things that that <clears throat> I found in, in working with the Allergy and Asthma Network, just their their um, emphasis on shared decision making. And uh, I, I know that when when I first started practice, there were a lot of physicians that took the the father knows best, Marcus Welby, uh, MD. But really, most of our patients in this digital uh, age are, are looking for somebody who who presents options to them and and is is, is a research for them. So in, in terms of of monitoring asthma. Historically, we focused on two areas, uh, measuring pulmonary function and, and measuring adherence. And in fact, as we're, we're, we're moving forward to the digital age, we have physiologic measures, we have adherence measures, and thankfully now here in 2022, we have ways to bill uh, for measuring um, uh, physiologic uh, outcomes and ways to, uh, 
to bill for measuring um, it, adherence outcomes. So um, first, I want to want to look at the whole role of, of, of measuring pulmonary function. And those of you who know me uh, know that uh, that I like to collect medical antiques and old books and and, and history. And I actually have a few pictures from my own, own collection that are here. But but me measuring pulmonary function goes all the way back to 150 A.D. when Claudius Galen developed a device that that attempted uh, to measure lung volumes. Moriel. Uh, later devised a cylindrical tube that was partially filled uh, with, with water, uh, a, a little bit beyond that. Uh, Kedich uh, invented the pul pulmometer uh, in 18, uh, uh, and, and the numbers are kind of getting off on this, so that was 1681 for Boreal, and for Kedich it's 1813, uh, uh, invented a pulmometer using uh, an inverted jar in, in water. And then Henry Hyde Salter invented the, the chymometer uh, to record uh, time volumes while, um, while uh, recording the air volumes in 1886. And Henry Hyde Salter uh, is, is of note because he wrote the first American language book on, um, uh, on asthma. So, and then uh, Brody uh, was the first to use a, a dry bellowed wedge uh, as, as a spirometer. And I apologize for the for the dates, that was in 1902 getting off here. Um, when I was practicing, the dates looked better than uh, this, but um, uh, we know what's important. And so here's a, um, here's a picture of Salter's uh, chymometer and Kedish's pul pulmometer. I found one of these on Wikipedia and one of them I found in, in, in a colleague's uh, 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 talk in a, uh, in a PowerPoint presentation, but just kind of a look at what was done even as, as recently uh, as, the, um, as the 1800s. And then coming forward more to the to the modern age, um, in 1970 we got the first analog spirometer. By 1979, uh, ATS, the American Thoracic Society, had set its first standards for in-office spirometry. Interestingly, I got a text message a couple of days ago from a, a nurse practitioner who used to be a medical assistant in, in my office who is kind of setting up her own practice uh, and has a, a, a spirometer there because I trained her how important it was to use a spirometer in monitoring asthma. And she said, which one of these normals uh, should I use? And, and unfortunately, there's just a, a long list of them now. And I, I didn't have a lot of good advice to them. But the first one was back in 1979. In 1980, Vitalograph came out with a spirometer model S1 that was probably uh, the first um, computerized spirometer. I actually got a, got, a, got a picture of that one. And then in, in 1990, we had our first PC-based spirometer. And th th this kind of you know, hits home to me because I remember when I was um, uh, in, in, in my fellowship in uh, 1989 to 1991, I, I knew the, the guys there near National Jewish at, um, at one of the companies was developing a, a PC-based spirometer and they used the fellows to kind of help us test with it. But I didn't really realize the, the um, uh, the gravity uh, of that at the time, because really, you know, doing my research for, for, for this talk, I mean, right as I was finishing my fellowship, was when really the first PC-based spirometers, uh, a spirometer became affordable to be able to have in, in, in a physician's office and really, you know, ushered in, uh, I think, a new age uh, of, of, of controlling asthma. Uh, so on the ne next slide, I got a couple of uh, pictures that I uh, researched on the the Dante Pulmonizer Performance Analyzer, and it has a digital display here, but it really it was thought to primarily have analog uh, circuitry. And then here, the Vitalograph Spirometer Model S 1980. This was a fuzzy picture, but it was probably the first true computer-based system there. And I mean, look how big it is there. I mean, the big printer and the, and, and the keyboard, even by the time in, in, in 1990, uh, when I started one, it was, it was uh, nothing compact like today, but pretty compact uh, compared uh, to that spirometer. So next, I, I want to talk about <clears throat> some home uh, pulmonary function uh, monitoring. And <clears throat> those of you who are in, in practice in the 90s may re remember this, the, the AirWatch. Uh, it was developed by a company called Enact and launched for, by a company called Muro, who was, was pretty big in the respiratory uh, space there. They had a, a brand of nasal saline and I think some ex expectorants. And, and this was designed to replace uh, our plastic peak flow meters. Uh, it measured an FEV1 or peak flow depending on how you programmed it and, and coached the patient to use it. Uh, it electronically transmitted data via phone lines. You, 
had to plug it in uh, but by, uh, to the physician by fax, and it was on um, thermal fax paper. Uh, again, those of you who, who weren't around in those days, thermal fax paper uh, is a mess, and to get it into a place where you had to, to get it into a, a paper chart at the time, you had to photocopy it. And um, really, none of us quite knew what to do with the reams uh, of data uh, that, was, that was generated by the AirWatch um, at, at, the, at the time. And, and, and really, uh, this was a neat little device. I've still got a, a working one, uh, but it was well ahead of its, its time. And because, because of the, the, the issues with knowing what to do with the data, how to transmit it, how, how, how to bill for it, I mean, it, it just, just literally large stacks of stuff that came in. I, I think I had a dozen or more, uh, more patients using this. And the next slide <coughs> is actually a photograph of one from my antique collection uh, that I actually didn't charge up for the photograph, but there's a photograph of it charged up. The little mascot for this was Wilby. And, you know, this person, you know, the, the leaders per minute there, that was, uh, uh, you know, 669. So I guess that's a peak flow we're lo looking at there. And it's the zone chart. It was 101% pre predicted. There's a little mouthpiece that, that, that folds down there. But this was a, a, a neat device that was <clears throat> kind of the first attempt to get um, home pulmonary function monitoring. So pulmonary function monitoring with spirometry, um, <clears throat> a number of, of pros and, and, and cons. Um, it's, it's an objective measure of asthma control, uh, perhaps still the best objective manager, still, still considered a, a gold standard. Uh, by 1990, it became relatively affordable to be able to do outside of a hospital setting and in a, a, in a physician's office. And it was something that, that could be compared over time. <clears throat> the cons, some of the home devices that were developed, never, like, the, like the AirWatch uh, and, and others that followed, never really gained a lot of traction. Uh, there's a relative lack of, of, of data that daily monitoring with, with home use uh, devices improves outcomes, although, uh, you know, I think that's a need that we can fulfill. But <clears throat> the in-office use of spirometry, it's, it's only a slice in, in, in time. And that's one thing that I emphasize to the students that, that, that come through my office. You know, they do a, do a lung exam and I says, what, what percentage of this patient's life did you listen to their lungs? Well, you know, it's an irrelevantly small one. And again, with the with the pulmonary function that we do even every three months in a, in a follow up visit, I mean, we're, we're just looking at a tiny slice of time that <clears throat> that may not be um, reflective of what's going on at home and in the environmental things at home. And so that's where I'm, I'm excited uh, uh, about the advent of us being able to monitor this more at home. Uh, one more look at, at some historical stuff, uh, peak flow meters. Uh, that, that um, most of us uh, rem remember. I didn't realize this before preparing for this talk, but this is not an original one. This is just one that actually we used to use before um, allergy shots in my office, but it was first developed in 1959. Uh, peak flow meters are very dependent on the user. And really there's not a, a lot of objective data that using a peak flow matter uh, improves uh, outcomes. And they were prominent parts of NILBH guidelines early on that <clears throat> are getting to be more of a footnote um, here recently. So I want to look at some non-electronic means of, of monitoring ad adherence. And <clears throat> the first one is, is pharmacy data. When I first started practice, if I had a patient that was uh, that I suspected of being non-adherent, I'd get one of the medical assistants to call the pharmacy and find out how often they filled uh, their controller medicine. Um, another option, we could get the patient to go to the pharmacy and get a and get a printout. Of course, if the printout showed they hadn't filled their medicines, it didn't often show up in in, in my office. And the other, you know, part of that was is that that even you know uh, back in the 90s, a lot of people used multiple pharmacies, and now people are using more pharmacies. People with high uh, uh, deductible plans or high high copays are often using things. Uh, like discount cards, uh, I'm not talking about manufacturer coupons, but discount cards uh, to find uh, deeply discounted prices. I know for, for pentoprazole, uh, which is not a topic of this, but with a specific discount card, I can get 180 of them uh, for $15 at one pharmacy, whereas 180 costs close to $1,000 at, at, at another pharmacy. So I've got a lot of patients now that are shopping uh, around. Um, 
One thing that happened in the in the late nineties and early two thousands were some online databases that the insurance companies got together, and they were even beginning to integrate with some electronic health records, where with a couple of clicks you could find out how often the patient was 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 using this. And fortunately, uh, I, I didn't at the time have an electronic health health record, but I would access it manually. And when our uh, our big payer in Alabama quit quit using it because I accessed it frequently on almost every patient. Uh, they told me they quit doing it because I was the only doctor uh, that was accessing it. It was just it was just too expensive uh, to to maintain. Another thing that, that has become available and that's still happening is these faxed or mailed notices to the doctor about adherence. And uh, for those of you who are are patients and non physicians that are that are listening, I literally on a quarterly basis, get a foot of these, okay? So if we put a ruler ne next to them, I mean, it, it's it's a foot tall, uh, reams of data. And when the insurance company is reporting to you that your patient is, is not adherent, I think there's some medical legal responsibility for that. I know most physicians don't do that, but I, I go through most of them individually, and many of them are false alarms. Like, like for instance, as a mean to save money, and this is an off-label use, so in, in case you know we're, we're getting CME here, you know, if a drug is approved FDA for twice a day, and I'm prescribing it for somebody once a day, maybe because I want to save money or they don't want to change the, the, the inhalers, then it will get an alarm that they were um, uh, not adherent. But one of the limitations of, of all of these is just because you fill a prescription doesn't mean you're actually taking a prescriptions. And, and one of the things that is, is most frustrating to me is some of these new auto refill uh, programs by the chain pharmacies. And it makes all these strategies even less valuable. I, I can remember talking to the, the patient about adherence and, you know, oh yeah, I'm taking it all the time. And then I would ask them about their specific prevention inhaler. How many of those do you have at the house right now? Knowing that the pharmacy will only fill you know, should only fill enough to last them. I've got 15 of them at the house. It's like, oh my gosh, you know, you haven't been taking your medicines even close to regularly for the last two years. Um, and and uh, amazing, if you'll ask the questions, you know, how many of those do you have at the house? Uh, they'll, uh, they'll, um, they'll, they'll, they'll tell you on that. And the, my favorite one on the auto refill programs is the albuterol. As we all know, uh, a canister of albuterol should last a year, but the pharmacies don't know that. And so I, even though I don't give a refill on albuterol, they want to auto refill it on a monthly basis. Now, the next slide is, is, is an example of, uh, of something actually mailed or faxed. Uh, this one was mailed uh, to, to, to my practice and the, the, the patient information there was de-identified. And this is actually a patient that has eosinophilic esophagitis and asthma. And this is a year's worth of data. And we can say this gentleman, and I won't call his name, but I could, was very non-adherent, both with his EOE treatment and with his, um, and with his asthma treatment. And uh, it is, is something that um, I have addressed with him regularly. So next, moving into stuff that, that's, that's kind of more available, some of the attachable devices to monitor uh, it, it, it adherence and inhalation. Uh, the newer devices uh, attach a sensor device uh, and uh, link up with a mobile app that gives feedback to patients and providers uh, about it adherence. Um, initially, um, they would make a new device uh, for each inhaler. But as we all know, the pharmaceutical companies would keep coming out with, with, with new inhalers, and now we're coming out with generic versions of the inhaler. And so, you know, each time uh, a, a new device would come out, the old <coughs> attachable uh, inhaler device would become antiquated and you'd have to get a new one. And the companies that were making these attachable uh, de devices would have to get an FDA approval every time. And so uh, there's a combination product, uh, fluticasone salmeterol, uh, that we all know is out there and uh, there's two brands out there and at least two or three generics that are out there and so you know every time the pharmacy switches between a brand uh, of, of that you'd have to get a, a, a different uh, device and it became a logistically kind of kind of challenging um, model and um, you know because you know the pharmacy benefit managers would make them change um, uh, an inhaler so you would you'd, you'd have to be constantly buying a new uh, device to do it. And, and the original devices in this space, uh, and, and this goes back a little bit even fur further, and I've got a couple of these in my collection. I, I forgot to take a picture of those, but they were just simple dose counters that you just put on the top. The patient would bring the inhaler in and you, you, you'd look at the, 
uh, the counter that was um, that was um, there. So this is just kind of a, a, a schematic of the electronic monitor. So this is a traditional press and breathe inhaler. You snap on a device in, in the top, so it's automatic. When you pump it, there's passive collection of the data. It collects when and where and, um, and, and how much medicine was used. Uh, this pr particular type of attach on device here doesn't collect uh, spirometry data, but some of them in, in subsequent pictures we show you do. Uh, then it transmits data to the uh, to the mobile app. Uh, earlier ones had to be attached, more recent ones through uh, Bluetooth. And then the app educates the patient, uh, reminds them to take the medicines, reminds them when they need uh, a refill on it. And then if the patients choose to share the data with, with the provider, uh, then, then you get a dashboard and you can go through and quickly take a look at, at patient ad adherence and hopefully con uh, improves um, asthma control. Just one example for me of, of the dashboard that I use with the commercially available device. I actually didn't look at it when the patient was in the office, but after they had, had left and, and, and saw that she was blocking the vent uh, on, her, um, on her inhaler more than half the time. And my RN was able to educate her uh, on the phone uh, about the, the, the difficulty um, with that, and, and the next set of data came in, showed her that she was actually using it. So the next slide is just, just kind of an example uh, of a set of, uh, of attachable uh, devices. Some of these are available in the United States. The one in the, um, in the corner down here by Propeller Health is one of the, the most researched ones, uh, and not all of these are, are, are available in, in the United States. And this is just kind of going through the, the list of them, and um, and, uh, you know, only three of them here are doing an in inhalation profile, and, uh, and those are the ones that are not available in the United States. All of these, uh, you, know, you know, check the dose activation and, 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 and preparation with it, but just um, a, a, a number that are um, available. Um, um, so, next, we're, we're, we want to look at integrated devices. Uh, to monitor adherence. And in 2020, we got the first FDA approved uh, integrated uh, advice to uh, monitor adherence. Um, uh, a smart ship was integrated to the top of a dry powder inhaler. Uh, it communicated with uh, a smartphone and several different ones by Bluetooth. Uh, the smartphone could then remind the patient to use their medicines. And in the particular one that I, I, I'm using, the patient has the ability to turn that off. And I was you know, actually talking to a patient about her poor adherence. And I says, okay, so aren't you using this? Yes, I am. Do you get the alerts? I got tired of seeing them, so I turned them off. Um, so, you know, a, a little shared decision-making opportunity there. And then the patient has the option to electronically transmit data to the, to the, to the patient. And, and there are a number of ways that that can be done, either directly to a preventer, printer in the office, can be emailed or can be sent to a dashboard. And then alternatively, the physician can look at the data right at the smartphone during the, uh, during the visit. Um, <clears throat> for a patient of mine that was only using a, a, a rescue inhaler, I actually, I actually looked at it while it was in his phone and then had it emailed to an office email so that I could have a copy of that uh, just, just this, this week. And so um, uh, some incorporated electronic devices, I know one of these for sure is available in the United States and one of them may be pending approval. Some of them are, are only uh, available internationally. The, the DigiHaler device is one that's available uh, here that monitors uh, both. And this is just looking at the incorporated device. So the DigiHaler device monitors dose activation, preparation, inhalation profile. Um, one of them is on a soft mist humidifier. Uh, so just, just uh, a variety of, of agents that are going to be available. Some of these are waiting approval. Some of them are available in, in, in other countries. So this is uh, kind of the brave new world that we're looking at. So next, I want to change gears a little bit and, and look at some, some pulmonary function uh, measuring uh, devices. And um, <clears throat> freestanding home devices, I did a little research on this, have been available since uh, 2012. Um, I, I had a hard time finding one a, a little bit earlier, but this kind of monster device right, right here that looks like a video game uh, from, the, from 2010 uh, was one that I did it. And, and that device didn't gain a huge market share. There's a, a, a couple uh, more, uh, more, more recent ones here. One of these was actually shared with a friend of mine from, from Macon, Jack Langford, um, that um, 
was, was telling me, or Jeff Lankford was telling me about these and one that he particularly uses in his practice. And they think hook up with smartphones can be particularly useful in, in telemedicine. These things compared to an in-office spirometer are remarkably um, accurate when they're new and they're, um, and they're quite, uh, quite affordable. Um, so do, do we still know what to do with the, the reams of data and um, is there objective data on, on home monitoring of the lung function that, that, it, that improves, uh, improves the outcome? So I, I don't know in terms of, you know, managing the, the, the reams of data, how much farther ahead we are right now. I know that several companies are working on artificial intelligence to help monitor that data for, for us. And I know that companies are gonna have to go before the FDA to do that. There's nothing quite there. So still right now, we're, we're, we're looking at doing something that's gonna be uh, rather um, uh, manual with that. So next, I, I wanna look at a couple of studies uh, that look at uh, the attachable uh, sensor device in controlling asthma to get some, some objective measures here. And uh, based on the references below, this was the, the, the propeller device. And um, the standards for asthma control include uh, use of short-acting beta agonists, decreased emergency room uh, visits, decreased hospitalizations. And I've got the two studies used there. And these used an attachable sensor device, uh, a mobile app, and then gave feedback both to patients and to the providers uh, about it, it, it adherence. And, and the first thing that I wanna look at is, is uh, short-acting beta agonist used. And so this is uh, an attachable sensor device uh, looking at decreased daily short-acting beta agonist use. The, um, the routine intervention was the orange line uh, or the routine care, the intervention was the purple line. And the daily mean number of uh, short-acting beta agonist uses per person per week was decreased by 0 uh, uh, 0.41 for the group using the device compared to 0 0.31 for routine care during the first week and throughout uh, the, the study. And obviously anytime anybody's in a study, there's, there's a placebo effect just because you're being monitored, uh, you know, that they're better at, at, at using their their medicines, but because of the size of the study, this was a statistically uh, significant. In the next slide, uh, I want to look at proportion of of um, of uh, Saba free days, so free of short-acting beta agonists. And again, the orange is routine care, the blue is the intervention, and the proportion of Saba free days increased uh, by 21% for the group using the device compared to only 17% for the group with uh, routine care. And these studies were, again, done using uh, the Propeller uh, Health Asthma Platform, and the, the studies were done by Dr. Uh, Marchant, who's actually quite an quite an expert uh, in, um, in this area. And then the next slide's a little bit more complicated. Uh, this, is, this is looking at the emergency department and hospitalizations. And so uh, we had 224 patients in it, and um, we were looking at 365 days before the intervention and 365 days after it. So that's pre-enrollment and post-enrollment in terms of the, uh, of the color uh, that was, was there. And, um, so emergency department uh, visits here, hospitalizations here, and combined here uh, significantly decreased uh, uh, per 100 patient years um, in asthma, asthma utilization. Again, relatively uh, small studies looking at, at, at some of this. So now, you know, where are we? The brave new digital inhaler world brings many questions, and we're going to address those here in the, uh, in the final uh, part of the talk, you know, who owns the data? Who controls the data? Who interprets the data? Who's a candidate to get a digital inhaler? And will it improve outcome and reduce costs? And how how is how is interpreting it it, it paid for? You know, a, a big thing when I'm doing shared decision making with with my patients and shared decision making is, you know, how I decide who is a candidate to receive one of these. I kind of ask the patient about it. But you know, one of the biggest questions they have is is who owns the data? And 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 even though with most of the devices available today, the patient owns the data and, and controls the data. And quite honestly, I think that's who should own and control the data, not a pharmaceutical company or not a, uh, a, an inhaler company. A lot of people are afraid. You know, I, I, don't want, I don't want Big Brother you know, getting a hold uh, of my data as though you know, your adherence to your inhaled steroid is something that somebody's gonna blackmail you with. You know, I, I, don't, I don't know about that. 
Um, you know, who interprets the data? Is it a physician? Uh, can uh, a nurse practitioner, uh, RPA do it? Can a certified respiratory therapist uh, do it? Uh, these are a lot of things that we're going to you know, look at in, in, in the next slide. So who do, how do we decide who uses the technology? Well, I think the, the, the big thing is a, is a, a shared decision making. One thing that I have in, um, in my office, I actually have a, a sign on the wall about the availability of a, of a rescue inhaler uh, that, that doesn't use um, a, a spacer device. Uh, you know, and, and, and so you know, I, I bring it up, up to the patients in terms of you know, what it means for them to be able to have the data. Um, you know, what the difference is uh, in, in, in cost. Uh, for a lot of our insured patients right now, there's a very generous coupon for one of the ones that are out there. And as it turns out, um, a, a dry powder rescue inhaler you know, with a smart chip in it actually costs less than a dry powder uh, uh, rescue inhaler without a smart chip. And, and so the patients look at me when I'm doing the shared decision making, okay, so I get this extra benefit and don't pay anything extra for it. But that's not the case for <clears throat> all of our patients, particularly uninsured patients, uh, patients who aren't able to use a coupon. Those are people who on federal insurance like uh, TRICARE, uh, Medicare, um, Medicaid. You know, initially you might think that, um, you know, the good candidates for this may be the millennials or, or, or even the, the younger ones. Uh, the, 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 the Gen Z ones that uh, may be appropriate, more appropriate than technologically challenged baby boomers, uh, maybe in, in, in my generations, but yet I've got a lot of baby boomers that uh, have challenges with adherence. And when I do shared decision making with them and say, all right, if we switch to this brand of, of inhaler, uh, that's gonna cost this much different from that, this will send a message to your smartphone to remind you to do it. Now, some of them that are more technologically challenged we bring them into the office and set it up ourselves. Uh, some of them, you know, have a millennial at home uh, that, that can 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 do that for them. Uh, I, I, I do find I had had one particular uh, millennial patient who was a, a a close friend of mine that I actually I'm supposed to be in a meeting with that close friend right now, but I uh, inadvertently double booked tonight. So anyway, it was his daughter, and I mean, just her asthma wasn't well controlled. She wasn't taking her medicine at all. We upgraded to, to triple therapy, and I, I knew she wasn't feeling uh, the medicines, and so I, I put her on one, uh, uh, offered her one with <clears throat> um, that would sync up with her phone, and this is a millennial that just kind of lives on her phone, and um, I, I track her data now. I mean, she's not missing a dose or two a month where, um, I mean, there was before, I don't think there was a day or two a month where she actually took her medicines uh, uh, properly. Uh, so next, I, I wanna look at the, the, the privacy of the digital inhaler. HIPAA standards govern the exchange of this information. And we have some broad latitude right now because of the current uh, national healthcare emergency with, with, with COVID not to, not to do that. But I mean, I think if somebody is following due diligence to try and pr protect this data, you know, how much you know, would your adherence data on your inhaler be worth to a hacker? I mean, you know, just ask yourself, or how much harm uh, would be done if the information on what inhaler you're using uh, was, was made public and how much would a jury award someone who was hacked provided you know, the provider and the, the, the owner of the devices made uh, reasonable efforts. I mean, I, I think uh, any of us who know about technology, nothing is, is, is hack proof. And if somebody has enough time and, and money, they can hack uh, just, about, uh, just about anything, but really, um, you know, I think privacy is important. I think we need to, you know, obey the laws and and, and respect that. But just, you know, what happens if it gets hacked? You know, it's it's not like the uh, the end of the world that some people uh, uh, may make it out to be. Uh, the next few slides as we close, and Sally, I'm, I'm hoping we'll uh, I'll be able to close in time to have some questions. I promised you I would, so I would. How do we get paid to do this? All right, because that's kind of one of the the, the, the big big holdups with that. And I'm not trying to say that, that we're all, 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 all mercenary, but you know, if we're getting reams of this data and it takes us a long time to look at it, how do we get paid? Well, an older code that's been available is 99091. Um, it requires a minimum of 30 minutes of interpretation and, and review. And it's for the collective and, and interpretation of physiologic data. So this isn't for adherence data, this is for physiologic data. 
uh, listed in the code is EKG, blood pressure, glucose monitor, that's digitally stored and or transmitted by the patient and or the caregiver to the healthcare provider. You can bill it once every, every 30 days. Um, one thing that I worry about some of these separate codes is, is that just because it's a code and even the insurance company pays for it, it likely, if it's not a Medicare patient, would require a copay. And so how happy is your patient going to be to get a copay once a month for you looking at their spirometry data? Yeah, to me, that's an incentive for them not to send it. And, you know, based on bundling and stuff, just because there's a code uh, doesn't mean uh, that there's a, a guarantee we're going to get uh, payment. Um, uh, a newer code, but ones that have, have been around for a while, is remote physiologic monitoring billed as a separate service. Uh, these codes are not new. You can bill them on the day of the service. Uh, Medicare pays between $19 and $62, depending on the time spent reviewing uh, <coughs> the, the data. My question is, is, will private insurance companies charge copays on that? And, you know, again, just because there's a code uh, doesn't uh, mean that they will pay it. Um, new in, uh, but, but I am aware of, of physicians who do this with certain sets of patients and, and do get, uh, get paid uh, some of these fees uh, for, for monitoring lung function with some of the uh, uh, remote devices uh, that, that are uh, available. And then the next one is, is, is a new code and um, it's remote therapeutic monitoring billed as a separate service. And this is new beginning in 2022. Uh, CMS is gonna cover five new CPT codes. There's the range for remote therapeutic monitoring of the respiratory symptoms. Uh, Medicare, at, at the time I put the top together, was proposing to pay $51 for treatment and management and $45 for digital monitoring of the patient's respiratory symptoms. And you could build both codes where the data is collected digitally uh, uh, via a device. Uh, the code can be billed um, every 30 days as long as the patient needs to have the respiratory uh, mo monitored uh, and uh, new codes are, are, are billable that often. Again, I raise the question, are private insurance companies gonna uh, pay that? Since this code is, is new this year, I haven't actually uh, wheeled this out in, in my own practice, but I, I do think the, the commercially available device uh, from, from, from Teva, and again, we need to look at, uh, at that uh, could, could, could be billable. Part of the problem though is that these are codes are, are, for, um, uh, are, are for Medicare and a lot of my Medicare because the Affordable Care Act prohibits them from using coupons, the, the rack price on, on these drugs is quite ex expensive and so the most of my patients who have these devices are commercial pay patients and uh, uh, I'm not sure any of the commercial um, insurance companies have picked up these codes, but I, I think this is something that's that's coming a, a, as we go forward in, in, in a way that we can, can do this. Now, I want to uh, next talk uh, about uh, some changes in the coding that happened um, on, on January 1, 2021, so uh, a, a year ago. Um, in the old way of billing back from the 90s, you had to have um, you know, an exam, a history, and complexity. And now uh, CMS has changed that just to, e to either based on medical decision making or, or time. And I've got listed here the times for the level of uh, follow-up visits, level two, three, four, and, and, and five. And if you get longer than 55 minutes, uh, at least for commercial patients, the, code, the, the goal of this talk is not to tell you how to code on this. The codes are different for, for, for Medicare, but you can use a prolonged, uh, prolonged services code on that. And remember the, um, the, um, the code um, for um, uh, the um, independent billing was 99019 that required 30 minutes. My question is, is that what if you really did spend the 30 minutes that was required to bill um, that code, um, where, where would it leave you? So in the next slide, the 2021 revisions allow for non-face-to-face -face billing time uh, from the physician or other qualified health condition. And so, um, you know, you can, you can bill face-to-face -face time and you can bill non-face-to-face -face time. And the non-face-to-face -face time includes reviewing of tests Here's the kicker on this code. It's the total time spent, but only on the date of the encounter, all right? And I was asked a question in a, in a recent talk at the, with the Alabama Allergy Society. I actually wasn't given the, the talk, but it says, well, what about, you know, if I see the patient at, 
you know, at 4 p.m., you know, can I interpret it the next morning? It's only, you know, 12 hours later or, or something like that. But it has to be on the same same calendar day. And so, um, you know, what, what I tend to do with, with these is, is that I review this data on my digitally monitored patients before they come in. Now, doing that, there's a risk that they don't show up. And so I reviewed it and couldn't bill for it. And so the time spent uh, the same day um, uh, accounts, and, and I can do it after the, the visit as well. I think I missed, mentioned one earlier, a patient that um, <clears throat> I looked quickly at his phone while he was in there, downloaded the, the, the data to a secure email address, and then spent some time uh, reviewing it. But if you spend 10 minutes um, each, either at the beginning or at the end of the day, reviewing the data of all, all these patients, it's, it's a full level encode up. So if you, um, I'm going backwards here. So, you know, 10, 20, 30, 40, 40 minutes that we're coming through right here, it's a full, a full code up. And, and particularly for patients that are, that are complex, a lot of the patients that we may choose with shared decision-making to share this with, maybe some of our, our, our sicker patients that are, that are, that are doing that. Um, we get a, a higher level of, of service um, out of it. So, um, so just in recapping, the um, the brave new digital and halo world brings many patients. You know, who owns the data? Well, is it the patient, the doctor, the inhaler company, uh, the device company? It needs to be clearly disclosed. I personally. I personally fall, I think the patient needs to own this data. Uh, I think the patient needs to own the data and needs to be able to share it. But I think, you know, if you're, you're a patient looking at using one of these devices, regardless of whether it's for asthma or diabetes or other condition, whose data is it? You know, who interprets the data? Doctor, nurse, there's some new pushes to have respiratory therapists to be able uh, to, to do that. Who's a candidate to receive the digital inhaler? I mean, a lot of us think that maybe it's just severe uh, patients. I, I'm not. I'm not one of those, but you know, uh, eventually, uh, you know, maybe when they're not great coupons on these drugs, it may depend on the, the cost and if we can prove uh, cost reduction on that. And in terms of improving outcomes and, and, and reducing cost, um, clearly, um, I, I think we're looking at, at, at more studies uh, that need to be done. Dr. Marchant has done some some great things, but uh, I think there's some real world studies that are that are ongoing right now, and I'm. I'm looking forward uh, to, to, to the results of those. So um, I think this is my my final slide and, and, and Sally asked me to leave 10 or 15 minutes and I think I'm between 10 or 15 minutes uh, right now um, on the questions and we'll, we'll get to as many of them as we can. Sally, are you still with me or am I by myself? Oh, I'm still here. I'm still here. This has been great information. I've been really enjoying listening. So our first two questions are more like housekeeping questions. So you can actually take a minute to take a breath and I'll answer these first two ones. Uh, the first question is, will there be certificates or CEUs for this training? There's a certificate of attendance in your handout pane uh, on your go to webinar control panel that you can download and print out. But please do that now because when the webinar turns off, it's not available. CE, you're going to be able to get continuing medical education through the Online Learning Center of the American College of Allergy, Asthma, and Immunology, and continuing nursing education would, will come to you in an email from Altus Learn. So watch for those things. And the second question is, is this being recorded and available to us later with slides? The answer is yes and no. So yes, it is being recorded. And you can go to the bottom of our homepage. We usually post it within about 48 hours. Go to the bottom of our homepage, and our homepage is allergyasthmanetwork.org. And you go all the way to the bottom of the page. And not only can you find all of the recordings from all of our webinars, but also you can find uh, places to register for upcoming webinars. The, we will not be posting the slides for this webinar series because it's for CE. So uh, we, on, our, on other ones, we do post the slides, but this, this, this uh, webinar series, we don't. But the slides so, will be part, part of the presentation. You're not gonna delete out the slides while we're oh, talking. Oh, no, no, no. If you listen to it again, uh, and, and, and you know, you'll, you'll see the slides in the recording, but uh, we just don't give you copies of them. Okay, so um, 
someone wants to, uh, our first question is when all these devices are available will insurance companies cover the cost you know that's one of the the, the big questions about how how they they cover the cost and you know, initially, one of the pharmaceutical companies that are doing this is having a rather generous coupon uh, for these. But I think the long-term coverage is going to be dependent on uh, on whether we can show that these actually improve um, improve outcomes. Um, it's hard for me to imagine, that at least in a subset of patients, that they don't, because I've personally seen in my own practice the the improvements uh, in, in adherence. Of, of, of individuals. It's just remarkable to me the number of people in their 20s and, and, and early 30s that just, I mean, they're just attached to their, their cell phone and it's just kind of a, a, a part of their life. And so I, I think if there's data that show that these um, <coughs> inhalers are paid for, um, uh, right now in terms of the uh, mobile pulmonary function monitoring devices, those are, are remarkably um, affordable uh, for um, for severe patients, and and so uh, whether insurance companies pay for those or, or not, I mean, I think that's more of a a, a one-time uh, purchase, and 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 some of the you know companies that are helping with the monitoring on that, maybe even providing them um, at at a at a discount. Uh, on that, but it can be incorporated as part of a, a, a of a telemed visit as well. So it, it, yes and no. There's not a lot of of coverage for them now, but we're just in the real early stages. Uh, it's it's helpful that we've got codes that uh, CMS has come out with that Medicare is, is paying for these. Although uh, truthfully, a lot of our Medicare age patients aren't doing that. But there's no reason a Medicare patient couldn't do one of these home uh, pulmonary function monitoring to, uh, devices. And I think eventually, as these gain a, a foothold. You, you'll, you'll see uh, Medicare programs and Medicare Advantage programs and Part D programs begin to pay for these smart inhalers. Thank you so much. Our next uh, uh, next thing is a comment from Lisa. She says, I love my propeller app and device. So obviously it's it's something that patients are enjoying. You know, I, you know, because this is for for education, I've tried to keep the mention of brand names to a minimum. The study that the studies that we showed were on the uh, on the propeller to device, but it's kind of hard to show examples of these without with you know actually showing uh, a product, and, and and none of these products are, are are generic. But I do know a number of people love the the propeller device. For those that don't know, it's an it's an attachable. Uh, the, the device. You know, my, my main concern with some of that technology is, is if your pharmacy benefit manager quits paying for your current brand of prevention inhaler, you got to get a new, uh, new, new device with that. And I, I don't know how things are where, where, where this person lives, but in, in my area, the pharmacy benefit manager is changing what they pay for fairly frequently. Okay. Yeah, that's always really difficult. Our next question is. How do you guarantee that the attachable e-devices do not interfere with medication delivery? Um, so the question is how, how we guarantee that the e-devices don't interfere with delivery. I, I mean, I think based on the research, these are FDA approved. And, and so we'd have to, you know, studies have to be done by the FDA and I'm sure they're uh, uh, monitoring. I haven't been directly involved in any of these studies my, myself, but that's one of the things that the FDA would be looking at in terms of the, the monitoring, uh, the delivery of the medicine, and you know if everybody in the, in the trial got sick using them, I'm not sure they they get approved. So we're gonna we're gonna have to rely on the um, the pharmaceutical and device companies that are that are making these and and, and our FDA to ensure that. And I, I have confidence in that. They have 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 fairly high standards. I think some of my colleagues may say higher. Higher standards, but I, I have confidence that these, if they're an approved FDA device, they won't interfere with delivery. Okay, our next question has to do with the Marchant study. Uh, the the, the uh, Michael's asking, do you know what the control who what was the control group data for the Marchant study for the ER and hospitalization rates? It was usual care, just with regular inhalers. Um, so you know one. One group got the sensor attached. The other group didn't get the sensor attached. That's that's um, uh, that, that's it. Now the hospitalization data was a pre-post type of thing, and so the the short-acting Saba was you know one one got it, and um, and one and one didn't get the attachable device. And then in the hospitalization, they were their own controls, and so there was a um, a year-long look-at period before uh, they got the device, and then a year after 
when they got the got the got the device. But uh, the other one was 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 you know just routine care. But obviously routine care by study monitor, which always improves adherence. And then you know uh, routine care with the intervention, and that's attaching the device. Okay, uh, Gary's asking, would you be able to provide a list of references for the studies and the coding information? Or could you maybe direct him to where he could find some of that? Pick the studies, I thought I had referenced on here. Yeah, I'm seeing those yeah. there. They're, they're still there. And then the coding stuff, um, uh, the, the coding information uh, will be available on, on this webinar when it's recorded, so you can come back and, and look at it. Um, I have given talks for the college. It's on the college website that has detailed stuff on the coding for it. Um, the only thing that I don't think is on the uh, on the college's website is the brand new one for 2022. And if you're a member of the college, there was an, an, an insider that came out within the last two months and I pulled this data to, directly from that. So, I mean, if you wanna look at the, the, the coding numbers again, uh, you can look at this webinar again when it becomes available because they're all, all, all there. Uh, there's a webinar that's more detailed just on the coding of this that, that I have done. Uh, that's, and Gary Gross did one as, as well at the meeting that's, um, that's available, I believe, on the college's website. Uh, all this stuff is on the, ins, uh, uh, in the Insider on the, on the college website. I, I mean, I, I do a lot of these socioeconomic talks and I'll, I'll, I'll give everybody you know, what the secret sauce is. I just go download, uh, yeah, all the insiders and click through. I, I give a socioeconomic uh, updates for regional societies uh, frequently, and it's not that. Uh, I mean, I'm I'm past chairman of advocacy, but I've been president of the college, and it's kind of a, a a separate job. And I still give the advocacy talks, and I understand them fairly well. The the secret sauce is is I just go back and read all the insiders, and um, I actually lift the stuff straight from it because. Um, in the past, when I was giving advocacy talks, I'd always have the um, uh, the advocacy council attorney re review this so that I, you know, was giving good advice. But I figure if I pull it out of the um, the insider word for word, um, <laughs> that it's already been reviewed by by the by the attorney, and I don't have to to, to do that. I've I've actually I've I got my slides on the iPad here here now. But the the new uh, 2022 codes, I lifted those straight out of an insider. Well, thank you for sharing your secrets with us. I appreciate it. Um, next question is, if you've been prescribing the Digihaler, how often have you had it easily covered by the insurance company or have you had to do a prior authorization or had to use a coupon? Um, the, the coverage for, the, for that particular de device um, is, is improving, but it's not great. Um, the, the coupon though is, is quite good. Uh, the, the problem with the coupon is, is that, that a number of the chain pharmacies for, for various reasons don't honor the coupon. Uh, there's at least one chain where the pharmacist is economically penalized for honoring uh, a, a coupon. I, I have found in, in my area uh, one uh, grocery store chain and, uh, and private pharmacies that are pretty good about honoring it. And with the, with the coupon, it's affordable for most, most patients. Uh, for people that aren't eligible to use a coupon, uh, that would be government ones. It's, it's, a, it's a little bit more expensive, uh, I believe, at least in my area, TRICARE South. I know the, um, the digital rescue inhaler um, is, is covered. I, oh boy, I don't think the prevention in, in, inhaler um, is, but I, I'm certain uh, for a tier to copay the um, uh, the albuterol uh, digital rescue inhaler it is covered. And I have a no, no number of, or maybe it's just the respite click device. I can't remember remember that for sure. But for for some of them they are. But for the for the government sponsored, you, you can't use a, a coupon, and so it gets uh, logistically different. But I'm I'm hopeful that more insurance companies will um, will be able to cover that um, as we as we go forward on that. Okay, our last question is, how has COVID affected spirometry testing in your practice? Wow, that is absolutely uh, the, the million dollar question. I'm actually looking up the answer on the- um, I was thinking uh, maybe that was a whole nother webinar. <laughs> um, 
I, I'm looking at the TRICARE coverage on this one. I hate not to give an extra. No, the digi digital inhaler is not covered on, on TRICARE, only the, the non-digital version of those inhalers. I apologize for giving wrong information. All right, so how has COVID done uh, spirometry? Well, I'm I'm part of a national group, Alibi Health, and we've got some, some guidance for Al Alibi Health on what we're gonna do and how we're gonna do it. But the, 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 <clears throat> the final answer is there's no one size fits all solution uh, for everyone. I remember in the height of the COVID crisis, I was aware of a practice in Dothan, Alabama that had a nice back porch that willed their spirometer outdoors um, uh, every every day. Uh, the spirometer I use it has a biological filter on it. It hasn't been tested for COVID, but it's been tested for influenza and tuberculosis and, 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 and traps it. Um, we um, certainly have all of our, our staff members, uh, you know, wearing, uh, wearing, wearing masks. Um, we try not to have any other uh, patients in the area when, when spirometry is being done. Uh, we're not particularly doing spirometry on sick patients. Now, I'll, uh, let me be specific on, on that, acutely sick patients. We see a lot of patients with post-COVID syndrome. So someone who's tested positive for COVID and they're you know, 10, 14 days um, out from, from having COVID that we will often bring those patients in to blow spirometry to see if they've got a post-COVID uh, post cough or their asthma is really flared that they might benefit from more, more steroids. And so when I say I'm not doing spirometry on sick patients, I'm not doing it on acutely ill patients, but we do have patients that like, you know, had, had COVID at, at Christmas and they're still coughing here on, on you know, January 27th. Yes, we'll do spirometry on those patients. We, we particularly though on those, make a huge effort to clear the area. Uh, we, we often just bring those people straight in from the parking lot because we don't want anybody in the lobby coughing because everybody's gonna think, oh my gosh, you're bringing somebody in here, you know, that's got the plague. <clears throat> and even though we, <clears throat> we know from, from history that, that they don't, and they've, most of these patients have ha had, a, had a negative test, so they're, 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 they're post COVID. But um, yeah, we particularly try not to have in, any, anybody else uh, around while we're, we're doing it. But again, you know, different institutions have different cares. Allergy Health, who I'm working with with now, we're, we're supposed to do, you know, visits on acutely ill patients by, by, by telemedicine uh, right now. And we are doing a, a number of a telemedicine visits, but uh, yeah, I'm not, I'm not refusing to do spirometry on everybody with a cough, but um, we're, we're being careful how we evaluate that. Sally, do you, do you think that's a decent answer to that question? I think that's a great answer to the question, Dr. Meadows, and we appreciate all of your answers and all of the things you shared tonight. Uh, we have one last comment in our in our box. It says, awesome information shared this evening, and I agree with that. So, Dr. Meadows, thank you so much for joining us tonight. Well, you're I, too, you guys are too generous. I appreciate it. Uh, we appreciate you. So, I'd like to also thank our listeners for joining us today. So at this time, please download your certificate of attendance from your control panel. If you have any difficulties, please email us using the link in your emails. Please join us for our next Advances in Allergy and Asthma webinar when we discuss sublingual immunotherapy and explore a single versus multiple allergen approach. This webinar will be on Thursday, February 24th at 4 All right, Sally, I think we lost you there for a little bit. It seems like things are still going on here. So I'm going to I'm going to close on, on, on this one. You know, visit the Allergy Asthma Network.org. More information available on the college uh, website. And we ask that you remain online for another two or three minutes to complete uh, the evaluation and the, and, and the survey here. And uh, I hope I'm not talking on top of you, Sally, but you disappeared from me. All right, well, thank everyone for attending.